ladies and gentlemen, Governor Mike Huckabee. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming today, and welcome to Huckabee from the Fox News studios in New York City. Well, since the shooting in Tucson, Arizona, that wounded Arizona Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords and killed six others, many more details of the accused killer's troubled life have emerged. Were there enough warning signs from the suspect, Jared Loeffner, to prevent the tragedy? We're going to talk to renowned psychologist of mass murderers, Dr. Helen Morrison. And what can be done to make sure that public officials and their constituents are safe at public events? Former CIA agent Mike Baker will be telling us. And what's it like recovering from a shot in the head? Jackie Millar took a bullet in the brain and survived. She shares her amazing journey tonight. Then, Captain Sully, the hero of the miracle on the Hudson, joins us on the flight's second anniversary. So is flying safer now? Sully is going to settle that question. Plus, and I'm pretty pumped about this, Mark Farner, co-founding member of the classic rock band Grand Funk Railroad, is here to do the locomotion, as well as to share a touching story of a family tragedy and how fellow rockers are coming to the rescue. You probably know that we were preempted last weekend due to the tragic shooting of Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords and the senseless murder of six people at the hands of an irrational and deranged lunatic. The interview with Ted Nugent and the segments with casting crowns and Stephen Curtis Chapman and his wife Mary Beth will be seen in the near future. The evil actions by an unbalanced madman stirred all kinds of debate. Some of it was almost as irrational as the crime itself. People tried to blame talk radio, television, or political speech for the shootings. But as the facts got louder, it was increasingly clear that the killer wasn't acting out a political point of view at all. He was just crazy. The memorial service on Wednesday night saw commentators trying to determine what kind of impact the president's speech would have on him politically. I was disgusted. Have we no shame? Are we so fixated on the political end game that we can't pull aside from it to simply recognize that the president of the United States was speaking to a nation which was hurting and grieving over the cowardly killing of a nine-year-old girl, a federal judge, a bright and idealistic young government worker, and some dear citizens who just wanted to talk with their congresswoman. The president's speech was his finest since taking office. I commend him for his comforting words and his ability to bring the nation together by speaking personally and insightfully about all those who had lost their lives. Now, to those who try to speculate on whether it helped him politically, I say shame on you. What it did was help all of America spiritually and emotionally. Can we not simply appreciate that he's a father of two precious daughters as well as a spouse? And as he spoke, he not only did that as president, but as a fellow human being who felt grief and pain. Oh, I know some criticize the atmosphere of the arena in which the service was held. I understand the discomfort many of us had for what we thought would be maybe a somber and reflective service of remembrance. But since I was not there, I will not judge the motives of those who were. Now, truthfully, some people eat their soup louder than others. Doesn't mean the soup tastes different. Some people respond to grief or to God differently than others. But there isn't a right or wrong way. There is a right way, however, when it comes to sometimes having the decency to put politics aside, cease looking for some hidden agenda, and maybe just finding an answer in the shortest verse in the entire Bible. Jesus wept. And so did we. That's my view, and I welcome yours. You can email me at mikehuckabee.com. Click on the Fox News feedback section, and remember, you can join my Facebook page, follow me on Twitter if you'd like to. You can also access lots of special features. Police records show that suspect Jared Loeffner showed many signs of erratic and antisocial behavior over the past few years. But were his actions consistent with those of a potential killer? Joining us now is forensic scientist Dr. Helen Morrison, who specializes in the psychology of serial killers and mass murderers. Dr. Morrison, thank you for joining us today, and I uh, want to get right to the, the heart of this issue that has just troubled this country. Were there signs that 
Jared Loeffner was demonstrating that maybe someone should have seen and could have seen that could have prevented all of this? Absolutely. One of the things that we saw early in his history is that he had a major personality change between 10th and 11th grade in high school. Now, a lot of teenagers are pretty erratic in themselves, but he changed from being a functioning, well-indicated individual who had social life to becoming part of the culture that was considered dark. Whether he experimented with marijuana at that time is, is not clear, but he did show this massive change which continued. The signs that we saw and even the college saw was his erratic behavior, his speaking what considered to be nonsense, his argumentativeness, and his belief that he was better really than anyone else. And those were the beginning signs that they could have recognized as belonging to someone who was paranoid. We have some rather disturbing video. This has uh, just been released oh, yes. this weekend, Dr. Morrison, and I know you've had a chance to look at it. I want us to take a look at it now and then tell me, uh, as a psychiatrist, what do you see as a result of this video? What mm -hmm. traits are you noticing that should have been the warning signs? Let's take a look at it. We're examining the torture of students. We are looking at students who have been tortured. I'm in a terrible place. This is the school that I go to. This is my genocide school. <laughs> Where I'm going to be homeless because of the school. The students are so illiterate that it affects their daily lives. If the student is unable to locate the external universe, then the student is unable to locate the internal universe. Where is all my subjects? You know, Dr. Morrison, I listened to this, and this is just a small portion of it. It's not the whole thing. There was several minutes of it. It's irrational. I mean, it didn't make sense at all. What, what do we glean from this? Well, basically, as you said, it is irrational. He comes out with phrases that have no meaning, except the one where he said that I'm in a terrible place, where he starts showing some emotion. Otherwise, he's completely flat and has thought processes that basically don't mean anything. I mean, they just come out of the blue. And we can call that a flight of ideas. He also talked about his being better than others. You know, the students are illiterate except for himself. Uh, nobody appreciates his talents. Nobody appreciates him. And he starts to go into the sense of being a victim, that he's going to be homeless because of this college. Yeah, some of that doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I mean, no. he, and he talks about the students are illiterate. Obviously, they're not yes. completely illiterate or they wouldn't be in college. Uh, but one of the right. things that, that I want to ask you to respond to is there always seems to be the reaction after some horrible tragedy where somebody needs to get yes. blamed. And if it's not talk oh, radio yes. or television or our commentators, then now let's move it toward uh, maybe the sheriff's department or the college. Uh, certainly, it's so right. easy for us to look back and say, why didn't they see this? But I mean, every day we, we see people that we kind of think to ourselves, that person's a little, you know, just a little off the, oh. the, the rocker, but we don't necessarily yes. want to go have them committed. Can you tell us what is that moment at which a person goes from being unusual, or we might even say weird, to being dangerous? Where's that line? The line is when this person who perceives himself as a victim has to find someone to blame. Uh, we always want to say it's somebody else's fault. We never look at the person who's going through this, who, or who makes this decision intentionally to kill someone. So what we're saying is, hey, uh, let's go back to this guy. Let's go back to s those warning signs. And let's decide that, at least in Arizona, call somebody to get him committed for an examination. But we can't do that in most other states. Dr. Morrison, stay with us. And uh, when we come back, okay. we know that members of Congress are protected by Capitol Police on the Hill, but many of them have no security when they return to their home districts. So what can we do to keep our leaders safe at all times? We're going to ask former CIA officer Mike Baker when we come back. 
This is Charlie, whose morning flight to London starts with arthritis pain. It takes time to start a small business. On the new TV network, Nat Geo Wild, there's nothing closer than running a zoo in your backyard. We've dedicated our lives to this. With 400 animals to care for, Bud and Carrie lead a busy life. There's no vacations, there's no sick days. Animals 24-7. People think we're nuts. You come back here just to argue with me? The animal is more important. Get the crate and get it over here. She wants her way, I want my way. My Life is a Zoo. New series premieres Monday, January 24th on Nat Geo Wild. Get closer. Every time you write something, it goes out over the wires. You've noticed that. Monday, Governor Sarah Palin sits down with Sean in an exclusive and addresses the anxious state of our union. Make the right choice Monday and watch Anna on Fox News. Last Saturday's shooting in Tucson has many lawmakers thinking about upgrading their security detail, and Capitol Police are reviewing security procedures for politicians at public events. Joining us now, former CIA covert operations officer Mike Baker. Dr. Helen Morrison is still with us uh, on our remote location from Chicago. Mike, let's talk about what are the toughest challenges that a security person faces when they're in a public event? Yeah, uh, I think. Just about anybody involved in this would, would come to an agreement that the, the most difficult challenge you've got is the, the lone wolf. You know, the, the individual, much like this shooter in Tucson, um, that carries out the entire operation on their own. Right? I mean, they, they're doing all the planning, they're, they're picking up their gear on their own, uh, they're choosing their target. You know, the only people they're really talking to are the voices in their head, you know, oftentimes. As opposed to if you're talking about Al Qaeda or any other, you know, organized crime, uh, gang activity, whatever it might be, you've got a group. And when you've got a group, you've got communication and you've got opportunities because of the way that they interact for uh, whether it's, you know, local, state, federal authorities, whoever's responsible for, for the security, to be able to either intercept communications or somehow mm -hmm. understand what their intentions might be and then either to develop sources or somehow prevent or, or minimize. But the lone wolf is always, whether you're talking about a, a, uh, a high-level state uh, visit or whether you're talking about just a, a Congress on the corner type event like this, it's always the concern. Do we run the risk of so overreacting to a situation like this that we make our public officials inaccessible to us and therefore in essence destroy our very democracy where our officials work for the people. You're right. It speaks to our First Amendment, you know, and the ability to, to assemble, the ability to, to, you know, redress our grievances. So we have to have that access. What you need to do is there's all these theoretical conversations that take place up at 30,000 feet. You know, they say, well, this is what we have to do. And all the, all the representatives start talking about how they're going to, you know. And then at the street level, you've got your operational realities. And oftentimes, the steps that you can take to something like this, the ones that are most efficient, seem a bit underwhelming in light of the horror or the tragedy that's happened. But in reality, they're the, the most efficient things you can do. And in a situation like this, unfortunately, there's, there's not much you can do in terms of gathering intelligence on someone like this unless you want to mm -hmm. start limiting your civil liberties. Right? I mean, in terms of, I mean, obviously, yes, there's, there's from a mental health perspective and giving that person, but the community college said, look, he can come back if he gets a, a mental health evaluation. Now, I'm a big fan of, you know, saddling your own bronc. You know, you've got to take personal responsibility. Well, that fell apart at the family level. Yeah, he, he was not able to do that. Dr. Morrison, let me ask you about this lone wolf idea. Okay. Uh, does he fit the profile of, of the person who is so isolated from reality, therefore he's isolated from the community and ultimately himself? Well, actually, his isolation is due to his paranoia. He's not going to trust anybody. And it makes it so difficult for people who are not trained mental health professionals to get to the bottom of the delusional thinking. But the college was aware enough. They told him in front of his father to get a mental health evaluation. Nobody acted at that family level. And so we have to take it back there. Uh, Mike, let's talk from a tactical standpoint. You're, let's say we're at a public event. How do you spot a guy that, that is potential trouble? I mean, because you look out in the crowd, there's maybe 75 people just milling about. What are the signs of mm -hmm. somebody who is really needing to be watched a little more closely, and what do you do if you see them? Well, you know what, honestly, I'm, I'm gonna, uh, I hate to sound like you know, Mr. Downer here. You're not going to spot them. Okay. You know, you, you, for the most part, and I most think that's people, my point. Yeah, there, exactly. You, yeah. you don't. You, there's no way to completely prevent. All the people say, "Let's prevent this." Is it possible to prevent every dangerous situation? 
Just like the war on terror, we're never going to get that down to a zero risk. Life has risks. Bad things happen. Unfortunately, we want to put them into a box to understand them. But in, in a situation like this, the best th things that they could do, um, yes, if you had trained people in that audience, in that, in that crowd, mm -hmm. uh, maybe uh, you'd have a combination. One or two uniformed officers to present that visible security. Maybe one or two uh, that would be uh, plain clothes, working the crowd, keeping an eye out. Much like a presidential issue where mm -hmm. you've got...